just a shadow on her memory And age has robbed her mind of dates and names Seems the pieces of her past are lost forever And the old home place just doesn't seem the same Faded pictures taped into the family album She tries in vain but can't seem to recall Just last fall But she still remembers Jesus And His amazing grace He left a mark upon her heart That time cannot erase She can tell you Every day to see her Behind their smiles They try to hide their pain But at times it's hard to keep The tears from coming When she asks her first Born child Now what's your name? Yet she knows every word To rock of ages Cliff for me You can feel his presence in the room When she quotes John 3.16 She was just a young girl When she first knelt down to pray She remembers when she met him Like it was yesterday Yes, she still remembers Jesus That, uh, that video I played, and I didn't want to bring everybody down, but it's one that 
Some of you may have heard, others have not. It was, that was the Booth brothers who were singing. And uh, the gentleman that was in the, one of the children that came home in the orange shirt was a, uh, was a man, Phil Cross, uh, who, wrote, who wrote the words and wrote that song. She still remembers Jesus' name. And it was a tribute to those who we have had in our past, in our family, and our friends who have uh, battled with Alzheimer's. That they, or, or dementia, they may not remember you. They may not remember who you are. They may not remember where they live. They may not know uh, any minor details, but they still remember Jesus' name. And we know that, that when, when God chooses to touch the minds of people and they're not able to recall we know that inside that mind they are fully cognizant of everything they just can't seem to put the words together but one thing that that we see is that those old saints that know Jesus Christ, they never forget that day. They never forget meeting him. So this was played as a, uh, as a tribute, but also as a request, is that we will always remember Jesus' name. Amen. We're here at uh, 45 years sitting on this hillside on Martin Ash Road. And it's hard to believe that the, the work that was started by that small band of, of people to reach the community here on Martin Ash, that, that their labor would lead on for now 45 years, that God is a people that he brings to carry it to the next to the next phase of its life. 45 years. Uh, it, it's a, it, it really is, when we think about the people who have gone through this building, whose lives have been affected, who have died being members of this church, we, uh, we, we really look forward to homecoming as a chance to, uh, to you know, reminisce, fellowship, and yes, enjoy the dinner on the grounds. And I, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a time when the favorite recipes are, are dusted off and made and we sit around the table, we enjoy each other's company and we enjoy the food. I don't know what it is, but we Baptists love to eat. We are the eatinest, meatinest people in the world. And we all look forward to those very special dishes that we know somebody will make because it's homecoming. And it, and it may be a banana pudding. It may be, um, it, it, it may be uh, cream corn. It may be um, uh, apple turnovers or peach turnovers, fried pies. You know, they, uh, they I, I, I'll be making my suggestions to different people because it's hard to believe that I was about 40 pounds less than I am right now when I came here. I can't imagine what y'all have done to me, but it's probably homecoming and those times that we can enjoy our sitting around and eating. I know we have those uh, special times that we look forward to and uh, and you know what is humbling and the reason that I've asked Dr. David too to preach the message on homecoming Sunday is that I got tired of being the only thing standing between you and food. And so I'm going to let Dr. Tu be that person, and, uh, and uh, I'm sure that he has owned over the years his ability to preach a short message, and I'm still working on that. You know, it doesn't take much to work up an appetite. 
an appetite for good home cooking. And this caused me to start thinking about another appetite that we have. One that we, we don't think of, but yet it's more important than just the physical appetite. And that is, and that is that we have a spiritual appetite. We have a spiritual appetite. Now, now leading up through homecoming and even after homecoming, I want to focus our attention and our hearts to feeding this spiritual appetite that we have. Now, when you and I get hungry, we either go to the refrigerator and get that favorite item that's in there, or we go to the, the cupboard and we get what we want, and some of us will go to the freezer and get that special ice cream out that we, uh, that we like to eat. But you see, we are so eager about feeding our physical appetite. Uh, Christians need to feed their spiritual appetite the same way. Our, our churches need to, churches around our nation need to strip away all of the stuff that is, uh, that is, that's identified with the world and get back to being the church that God intended us to be, the church that he refers to in Acts, the second chapter. And, you, and, and, and as we start to think about that, as a church, what are the things that we, uh, we are hungry for? You see, in Acts, the second chapter, it gave us, it gave us a picture of the early church. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, heard that word lately, were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from the house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Listen, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word each Sunday. We will look at one aspect of our spiritual appetite as it relates to the church, to us, the body of Christ. And as I begin today this, uh, this study, I, I want to ask you a very simple question. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? Four. If you will turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew chapter 5. It's good if you have your copy of God's Word and you're reading your Word. It's much more personal to you. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you. You can open it to the first gospel in the New Testament, Matthew, the fifth chapter. And uh, I'm going to be using using just one verse, but in honor of the word of God and the God of the word, would you stand with me as we read this one verse of scripture? Matthew 5, verse 6. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we approach your throne today, asking you to speak to us, Lord. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears to this one single verse. This one verse that will answer many questions. And Lord, I pray that your anointing will be on the message, the messenger, and every ear that hears this message. Every person, both present in our worship center, but also watching us via the internet. May we understand that this is your word that we speak. You have given it to us for this moment. Now allow us to hear from you we pray in Christ's name, amen, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. When I hear this question, what are you hungry for? I think of it in the physical sense because we identify hunger as something that we need sustenance every day. I know that some of you have your favorite places that you go to eat. And I know some of you have your favorite meal that you eat at home. But one thing that we know is in every day of our life, we will be hungry. God created us that way. But he also created us to be hungry for more than just physical food, but hungry for his food. Now, I want to go through some, uh, some responses that I have heard that to, to answer that question. What are you hungry for? Now, the first response that I've heard, you have too, is, I don't know. I don't know. Now, you think around your house. Think about it in the afternoon or early evening. It may be even it before breakfast or before lunch. I'm not sure how it is around your house. But when that question is asked, what are you hungry for? Around the Odom house, it is usually answered in the same way each time. I don't know. What are you hungry for? I don't know. I'm afraid that most Christians, most believers, aren't really sure what they're hungry for. What about the church? What, what do you want to happen in your life and in the life of this congregation? You see, the early church, they didn't have a fancy building. They didn't have electricity, air conditioning, heat. Uh, they, as a matter of fact, they didn't have religious freedoms. They had to hide when they were, when they were worshiping in fear of their life. You know, there are some places in the, in the, uh, around the country that still have to hide the fact that they have a certain faith. With the current situation going on in our nation, and especially when we are hearing of the uh, uneasiness in some of the uh, foreign countries, we hear through the pulling out of the troops of Syria. We're, we're hearing it. We're hearing about uh, even in China, where if a, a person of faith is caught reading their Bible or assembling together, they are, they are detained and sent to an education camp. Now, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't have to explain that anymore. But there are people who are starving for their religious freedoms in the world today. And we enjoy it every day in our life. Right here in Lilburn, Georgia, we can come together and not worry about the Gestapo or the church police coming to stop us from our worship. 
We take advantage of that sometime by not realizing that it is a blessing that we are able to come together. But what, what the church, the early church did have was a hunger and thirst for righteousness. A hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, the apostles had just been a part of this, of seeing over 3,000 people saved in one day. In one day. They were meeting every day. We can't get people to come together once a week. They were meeting every day in the temple courts. Uh, and eating together, moving from home to home and enjoying each other's company. You see, they did whatever it took to grow closer to God. They did everything that they could to grow closer to God, closer to one another, and to see people saved. That was their, that was their main hunger, their main desire. Unlike many or most of the messages, the sermons that I preach, we're going, to, we're going to discuss real ways to implement a biblical hunger and thirst for righteousness. It, not just here at White Oak or at One Life, but more importantly, in each of our lives. What do we do? How can we take the word of God and apply it in our life? The first statement that is made around my house when we ask what are you hungry for is, I don't know. Well, there's a second response to that question. Not only I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Now, I'm sure your partner, your wife, your husband, your spouse, your children has never said that. But back to the Odom house. After we both say, I don't know, it usually is followed up with, "Eh, it doesn't matter. Now, if you're just going through your life trying to survive, this may be your answer as well. Hardest decision in the world. What are you hungry for? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Anything, I guess. You see, the early church did whatever they had to do to see the kingdom of God grow. When we think of our spiritual appetite, do we say it doesn't matter? You see, the early church, they took their possessions, they sold them, and they they used the provisions uh, uh, to, to provide for other people's needs and wants and desires. They, They used their money from selling the possessions for God's glory. We have a difficult time meeting a simple budget. God, you, you see, the early church worked as a means to provide for one another. Now, that's a concept that we don't really understand is if we have brothers and sisters who are, who are in need, do we really have an appetite to, to try to help them? along their way. God has given us jobs. He's given us possessions. He's given us talents. He's given us spiritual gifts to edify the body of Christ. And when we, and you and me, when we have a hunger and thirst for righteousness, each moment that you are here on earth matters. It matters if you have that insatiable appetite and hunger and thirst for righteousness. What gifts and talents do you need to be using 
to discover a true hunger and thirst for righteousness? What are the desires? What are the needs? What are the gifts? What has God given you? And he's given it to you personally, but what gift or talent has God given you to use for the kingdom of God? As, as you stop to think about that, and God has been so good to us, and he has blessed us in so many ways, but what are we doing with those blessings to help further the kingdom of God? Well, when the question is asked, what are you hungry for? And you say, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's usually followed with, you pick. You pick. Or you choose. You know, it's amazing. To the Odom house. What are you hungry for? I don't know. Well, isn't there something? Well, it doesn't matter. Well, help me here. Uh, uh, what would you like? Well, you pick. And we just chase that thing around the flagpole several times. Hardest decisions in the world to make. Well, let's see who delivers. Uh, uh, what time does M and J's close? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, uh, okay, then, I, then, then we start down the street. Would you like chicken basket from Dairy Queen? Nah, all right, next door. What about a Subway? No. Well, McDonald's? No. Go across the street. Burger King? Nah, I don't like that. All right, let's see. Let's go further down the street. Uh, Oh, you pick. I, it, it never seems to amaze me how sustenance for our body is so difficult to answer. It's either going to be chicken or beef or pork, so you just pick which place you want it from. Now, nah, I don't feel like meat. Let's just have vegetables. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Tipsy Pig Barbecue. Uh, I don't like that as well. I, I'm sure that doesn't happen in your life. But, but when you stop to think about it, it's the way we approach, I, I guess, maybe because we've We've got a plenty. Maybe if we didn't have as much, we would realize that what we have is really a blessing. Here at White Oak, almost all of the time, the leadership of the church, that's the pastor and the deacons, we are, we're deciding what the church is going to do. And I think here is where we must, we, we must make a change. The church doesn't need to know, need uh, new programs. The church doesn't need extravagant worship concerts. The, the, the church doesn't need to add more staff. What the church needs to do is to be stripped of all of the stuff that keeps us from focusing on Jesus Christ. What, what is it that we need to be doing when we meet together? Who is hungry? Who is hungry to see someone else, another person, be strengthened in Christ? Who's hungry to see somebody that has a need that we're going to pray with them, love with them, cry with them, get excited with them when that need is taken care of? Who in the church 
is hungry to see people saved? Who, who is it in here that really has been praying and seeking God's face for one more soul to be added to the church? One more soul to be added to the kingdom of God. One more soul who has is, who is had their life changed from a road heading to hell to a road paved with gold heading to eternity. You see, everything we do should be for our hunger and thirst for righteousness. For that hunger and thirst for righteousness. We should desire what, what was happening in the early church. Because you see, the last part of that, if we had a hunger and a true thirst for righteousness, we would have what the early church had. Look at the very last thing it said. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Church, we have to stop and realize that's a report card on White Oak Baptist Church. When was the last time that someone was saved, that someone followed in, uh, with Jesus Christ and gave their life to him? That's an indictment on the church when we want to meet just for the purpose of meeting and greeting. But we do not have the hunger and the thirst for righteousness. I, I don't want today, nor the, nor the messages that I bring through this study, I don't want them to be just another sermon. But that is completely up to each of you. What, what you get out of a sermon, a message, and what you do with that message, that sermon, is your choice. You can hunger and thirst for righteousness. You can have a desire to see people saved. And you can be a part of that by simply saying, where do you go to church? Love for you to come to my church. It's free admission. Doesn't cost you a thing to get in. We have to, that has to be on our mind. Listen to me. As for me, as for me, and I can only speak for me, you can only speak for you. As for me, I am hungry for God to fill me until I am running over. That's my desire. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? What is your spiritual appetite? I want to be filled by God to the point that I am running over.